And in heaven, we'll understand all the words that are being sung. <laughs> Boy, it is so good to be back uh, with you in Longview, and I'm, I'm so grateful. Ruthie and I both so are so grateful for the privilege of being here. So thank you for the invitation on this World Outreach Weekend. Um, Alex and Wendy and Ruthie and I had breakfast yesterday morning, and uh, I learned something from you, Alex. We sat there, and we were talking, and the guy came up, and he was serving us. Alex asked his name. His name was Caesar. And uh, as he brought some food, after he brought the food, Alex took that little Easter card and said, I don't know if you're a religious dude or not, but uh, we'd love to invite you for Easter. And Caesar took that card, uh, thanked us, stood there a moment. I think he may show up on Easter. So can I just add a big, uh, yeah, go for it with those cards and take advantage of that. More people will show up on Easter than at any other time in the life of the church except Christmas Eve. So wonderful opportunity to invite people to join us in praising the Lord. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. There are not many churches that experience what you are experiencing this weekend. In fact, it's fairly rare, and it raises the question. The question just begs to be asked, how do you explain the missionary heart of this church? How do you explain that for many, many years, the, the flame of global, a, a world vision, global missions has just burned bright, bright here? What's the fuel that feeds the flame of world missions. And these are just a few of the missionaries who just happen to be available to come and be here. How do you explain that? What are the beliefs, the values, the, the convictions that, that motivate and inspire a weekend like this? All the giving, all the supporting, all the sending, all the uh, praying, all the going. How do you explain that? And I believe Jesus explains it in this particular passage from Matthew 24. This is the last week of his life. Look what he says. If you didn't bring a Bible, it'd be on the screen. Jesus left the temple, was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus begins to describe life before his return. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars and see to it. You're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. So wars False messiahs, claims to be uh, God, they've been around for 2,000 years. Those are not the signs of the return of Christ. Verse 8, verse 7, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginning of birth pangs. So international conflicts, horrible widespread famines, earthquakes, they've been around for 2,000 years. Jesus says they're just, they're just the beginning of birth pangs. Verse 9, you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. Dr. David Barrett, missiologist for a number of mission organizations, said there were more martyrs in the last 120 years than in all 20 centuries combined before this. Every two minutes, a Christian dies for his faith. Verse 10, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So Jesus gives his followers a heads up. Here's what life is going to be like until I return. False religions, false Christ, deceptive cults, people deconstructing their faith, people defecting from the faith, international hostilities, conflicts, famines, diseases, earthquakes, people losing heart, people growing heartless, uh, hatred, persecution of Christians, people having their lives shattered by all kinds of things. And Jesus says, I just want you to know this is what's coming. 
And then in verse 14, he gives what I believe is the sign. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So Jesus says, when you see the acceleration of missionary activity, when you see the gospel being proclaimed to peoples everywhere, he says, get ready, get ready. Then the end will come. So I want to I unpack, unpack four convictions, four core values that drive a church like this. They're all found in verse 14. And here's the first one. God's purpose, God's goal is that all people's know and worship him. And there's a child sitting here who's looking at mom and dad and saying, is people's a word? A word? And that's that's a really good question to ask because when Jesus talks about nations here, he's not referring to geopolitical countries like the U.S. or Korea or Brazil or, or England. He uses a Greek term, ethne, which refers to people who share the same language and the same culture. It's, it's like an ethnic group, a people group. So like in the Bible, the Jebusites or the Hivites or the, um, the Amorites, today we would say the, the Cherokees in Oklahoma, the Hispanics in Longview, uh, the, the Wolof and the Fulani in West Africa, the, the Uyghurs in, in East Asia. So he says, This gospel of the the kingdom will be proclaimed to all the world, to all nations, to all ethnic groups. So when Jesus says, all authority on heaven and earth is given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, panta ta ethne, to all the people groups on earth, all the different ethnic groups. And when Psalm 67, 5 says, may the peoples praise you, O God, may all the peoples praise you, it means may the Hazara of Afghanistan praise you. May the Maninke of Guinea praise you. May the Wa of China praise you. May the Navajos of New Mexico praise you. So I think what Jesus is saying in verse 14 is the goal of missions is worship. The people everywhere worship him in every people group. They make much of Jesus. They they trust him. They know him. They adore him. They they count him as their their treasure. They admire him. They, They glorify him. Now, if you have kids... If your child looked up to you and said, is people a, a word? I encourage you to go online to the Global Prayer Digest. Global Prayer Digest. And read a story about a people group that every day is a different people group. Read a story about what is happening. And perhaps think about as a family taking a mission trip to a people group like that. So conviction number one, God's goal is on all peoples. Know him and love him and Adore him. Goal number two, or conviction number two. God's goal is good news. Good news of great joy. The word gospel does not mean a philosophy, does not mean a a religion or an idea to argue about. Gospel literally means good news. The welcome, wonderful announcement. The gospel of the kingdom means good news about a, a king. This gospel of the kingdom, the good news about a king, a king who is all love and all justice, a king who is wonderful and is for us and with us in Jesus. You remember the message of the angels to the shepherds? Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people because today all the peoples, all the ethnic groups, because he's born to you for you this day in the city of Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So the gospel is the, it's the good news of a kingdom, about a king and the reign and the role of King Jesus. The gospel, friends, is the news that Jesus Christ has triumphed over sin and the devil and demons and death and judgment and shame and guilt and fear and addiction. It's the good news. We were in Honduras a few years ago. There's a women's prison in Honduras. Um, and they put some of the, the, the worst offenders in that prison. We met a young woman named Angelita, and Angelita leads a ministry every week going into this women's prison. Uh, there is in the prison a, a, a witch who has killed seven men. These are, these are the women who are there. And this Angelita loves these prisoners. She knows them by name. She knows the administration. She knows the guards. 
So as we accompanied her to this prison, I asked her, Angelita, uh, how did this, why, why are you doing this? And she said to me, she said, Jesus loves me and I love these women. And so she goes and provides their, some of the basic needs that they have. She puts arms and tries to encourage them. And I ask her, are you ever afraid? I mean, there's a witch who's killed seven men. Are you ever afraid? And Angelita looked at me and smiled and said, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And I, I said, you're a dangerous woman. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine Dooley led uh, recovery ministries in a church where we served one time. Um, she was a widow. Had served on the Navajo Indian Reservation. And uh, one day she called and she said, could, could you and Ruthie come over to our house? Something weird is happening in our house. And so we, sure, we'll come on over. And uh, we walked in and she said, there are noises, there are things happening in this house, and it, I'm frightened. And we're standing there, and I saw a picture go, Meow. and a light began to swing. So I looked at Ruthie, and, and uh, what do we do? So we went room to room, and we sang about the blood of Jesus. And we read scripture, and we asked Jesus to send whatever was there, wherever he wanted it to go. I called Elaine Dooley the next day and uh, said, how are you doing? And she said, I have had the most peaceful night. Years later, I'm in another state in another church, and I get a phone call, and it's Elaine Dooley. She's an elderly lady by now. And uh, she said, can I come by? I said, oh, please do. And she came by, and we talked a few moments, and I said, so how are you doing? And she, and she said, I still live in the same place. If I remember right, she said, I, I call it Peace Haven. Friends, we have the most shareable news in the world. I was talking with John Wood Woodward back here just a few moments, uh, moments ago, and he said that when, in Kenya, where he ministered, when people truly get to know Jesus, it changes their families. The men stop sitting around drinking beer and playing games, eating first, wife eating second, the kids starving. And he said, when people actually come to know Jesus and begin to follow him, one of the signs is the kids get fatter. Wives get new clothes. A husband starts helping around the house. That is good news to families. The message of the kingdom is just good news. The message of the kingdom is that Jesus has authority over Satan and all demons, over all angels, good and evil, over the natural universe, over natural laws and forces. He has authority over stars and galaxies and planets and meteorites, all weather systems, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, monsoons, typhoons, tidal waves. He has authority over all molecular and atomic reality, atoms, electrons, neutrons, protons, undiscovered subatomic particles, quantum physics, genetic structures, DNA, chromosomes. He has all authority over plants and animals, great and small, redwoods and whales, giant squids, giant oaks, all fish, all wild beasts, all invisible animals and plants, bacteria, viruses, parasites, germs, all the parts and function of the human body, every beat of your heart, every breath in your diaphragm, every electrical jump across synapses in your in your brain, over all the nations, he has authority over all governments, all congresses, all parliaments, all presidents, all dictators, and all courts, though they do not know it yet. He has authority over all industry and finance and currency, over all entertainment and amusement and leisure, over all media, all education, all science, all research, all crime, all violence, over every family and every neighborhood, over every church, every, every, every soul and every moment in every life that has ever lived or ever will live. And if you go to your home and look at the address of your home, just know Jesus is Lord there. He's just Lord. It's what it means to be king in the kingdom. And I know there are setbacks and there's coming and goings and all kinds of things. But he is Lord. That's good news. Because without him, there's just not a lot of hope. Without him, people don't know why they exist. Without him, people don't, can't enjoy forgiveness and a clean conscience. They can't find hope in suffering and hope facing death and freedom from a bondage and, and, and addictions. There's no eternal life. It's just good news. It's wonderful. It's the most shareable news 
in the world. And friends, when we talk about Jesus, we're not talking about bad news. We're talking about wonderful news, news of love, news of encouragement, news that a deliverer has come, that someone loved us enough, loved me enough to come and die in my place and rise from the dead and not only say, I will be with you, but I am for you. That is good news. I think that's why the Bible says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. I think that's why the Bible says, let the nations be glad. Let them sing for joy. The Lord reigns. So conviction number one, God's goal is that people just know him and love him. And, and Conviction number two, God's goal is good news of great joy. Conviction number three, God's goal will not fail. This gospel of the kingdom will. Spurgeon used to preach of another generation. Used to love to preach on the wills of the Bible. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony for all nations. Then the end will come. People all over the world, world will know and admire and love and respect and enjoy Jesus. His purpose cannot fail be stopped because it's based on a promise. I will build my church and not even the gates of Hades will overcome it. Nothing. Not the devil, not demons, not dictators, not closed borders, not visa restrictions, not financial setbacks and physical setbacks and rebellious children or apathetic Christians. It's unstoppable. All the nations, Psalm 86, 9, all the nations you've made will come and worship before you. They will bring glory to your name. Isaiah 46, 10, my purpose will stand and I will do all I please, says the Lord. So God's purpose cannot fail. It's the most solid thing in the universe. It's one of the most exciting parts about being a Christian, about being involved in what he is doing around the world in whatever way that you're involved, because you're not involved in something fragile, something vulnerable. Hey, other temporary setbacks. We all understand that it's a spiritual battle. And friends, if we are disobedient, if we're not missionary, the cause of God does not fail. He will move to someone else. His will will be accomplished. His purpose will stand. Even hell cannot stop him. And we're seeing that played out before our very eyes. Something is happening in our time that is unprecedented. It's never happened before. Thousands and thousands of Christian groups are mobilizing technology and research and strategic planning and global prayer to preach the gospel of the kingdom to every people group on earth. Listen to what Andrew Wall said, Scottish, a Scottish miss, missiologist. He said, at the beginning of the 20th century, well over 80% of those who profess Christianity lived in Europe or North America. Now, 60% live in the southern continents of Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Pacific, and that proportion is growing annually. Christianity began the 20th century as a Western religion, and indeed the Western religion. It ended the century as a non-Western religion on track to becoming progressively more so. Something is happening. 28,000 new Christians every day in China. 20,000 new Christians every day in Africa. 10,000 new Christians every day in Latin America. 100,000 new Christians every day, which is 3,000 every 45 minutes. There's a Pentecost every 45 minutes in our world. It's amazing. The harder the place, the more spectacular. Algeria, North Africa, where no one ever thought anything could happen. The gospel is spreading. The church is growing. Iran. They tell us that more Muslims have come to Christ in the last 20 years than in all of recorded history in that country. One city alone recently, 300 baptisms. Cuba. It's last week in Cuba. Last year, we attended the convention of the Eastern Cuba Baptist Convention, where they reported that last year, 110,000 people were baptized on that island. And that's just Eastern Cuba. <laughs> Stunning. They said they said tw had twelve missionaries come up on stage. Cubans come up on stage. Some elderly going to Saudi Arabia, going to the Philippines. Some young single adults heading some to hard places. Korea, nineteen hundred, no, no churches, 
Today, the largest churches in the world are in South Korea. In fact, South Korea sends out more missionaries than any other country except the United States and Brazil. China, 1950s, dark years of the Cultural Revolution. Missionaries were driven out. Tens of thousands of Christian workers, pastors, leaders, churches closed down. The question was, would the, would the church, would Christianity survive in China? Its very existence was illegal. Seventy years of oppression and persecution have seen the church grow from one million believers in 1949 to 100 million today, and they're saying that number's low. You heard of the Back to Jerusalem movement? Christians in China discovered the gospel always moves west. It just seems to move the west. It moves from <coughs> Jerusalem and moves into Greece and then to Europe and then to the British Isles and then onto the United States and then back around, back around to, to China. The gospel just seems to move west. So the Christians in China said, what's west of us? Muslim countries, Buddhist countries, Hindu countries. So tens of thousands of Chinese are moving, uprooting themselves, relocating in some of the hardest places in the world with the intent that the gospel continue to move west toward Jerusalem. There are Filipino maids who are Christians who are living in and serving in some very, very difficult places in the households of some of the princes of Saudi Arabia. And they are teaching little Saudi Arabian children Christian songs and Christian stories. A UPG means an unreached people group. It means that less than 2% of the population is Christian, that knows no, there's no Bible in their language. Look at these statistics. 1,900, 50,000 UPGs, unreached people groups. 1950, 24,000 unreached people groups. 1960, 16,000 unreached people groups. 1980, 12,000 unreached people groups. And it's really hard to get a, a, a number nailed down. Nailed down. But this came from finishing the task as uh, updated. Uh, I looked at it day before yesterday. Quote, there are currently 189 unengaged, means nobody's working there, unreached people groups over 500 in population still dwelling in their ancestral homeland. We've never seen anything like this. The gospel is going out to all the ethnes, the people groups. Maybe that's why Revelation 7 says, After I looked, and there behold me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, and they cried in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. God will see to it, God will see to it, that around the throne of Jesus at the end, there are people from every language group, every culture, every family group. It will happen. Only Jesus knows when that will happen. Only he knows when the job is completed. So God's goal is that people everywhere know and worship him. That is incredibly good news. Conviction number three, that goal cannot fail. And may Fellowship Bible Church of Longview be a sending, praying, supporting base for missionaries going to those hard places. Conviction number four, the price and means to accomplish the goal is suffering. The Great Commission will not be completed without suffering. Listen to the word Jesus said, verse 9, you will be handed over to be persecuted, put to death, you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. So some people receive the word with joy. Some people receive it with hatred. In other words, our effort to bring good news has a mixed response. That shouldn't surprise us. Jesus once said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And why should we expect to be treated differently than what our master was treated? The early missionaries to West Africa packed their belongings in caskets, their own. Adlai Stevenson, when he was ambassador to the United Nations, was asked what impressed him most about Africa. He said, the graves of little children of missionaries. Richard Wormbrand was in prison for 14 years, led an underground ministry. He said this, as a Lutheran pastor, 
I remember my last confirmation class before I left Romania. I took a class of 10 to 15 boys and girls on a Sunday morning, not to church, but to the zoo. Before the cage of lions, I told them, your forefathers in the faith were thrown before such wild beasts for their faith. No, you also will have to suffer. You will not be thrown before lions, but you will have to do with men who would be much worse than lions. Decide here and now if you wish to pledge allegiance to Jesus. And they had tears in their eyes when they said, yes. Diseases, angry people, rejection, loneliness. George Otis said, could it be, at the Luzon Conference on World Evangelization, George Otis said, could it be the reason we have not been successful in Muslim countries is not enough martyrs. This is really, this is real to our family. My son Joey was international missions pastor at Austin Stone Community Church in Austin. He invited and talked 10 of his friends into going to Libya with him. They learned Arabic in Alexandria, Egypt, went on to Libya, and included in that group was Ronnie Smith, 33 years old, husband to Anita, father to little Hosea. He moved to Libya with his family to teach chemistry at a school in Benghazi. Some thought him foolish, but he really believed that God had called him to demonstrate and share, share the love of Christ and do what he could to serve the people of Libya. He'd been in Libya a year. They were planning to come home to the States for Christmas. On December the 5th, 2013, 11.20 a.m., he went jogging in an upscale residential neighborhood like he normally did. A black jeep pulled up and eight bullets were fired into his chest. Anita lost her husband. Hosea lost his dad. Thousands of people in Austin, Texas lost a friend and our son lost a close friend. So Anita and the son came back to the United States and Anita wrote an open letter to the Libyan men who killed Ronnie. That letter went viral all over the world. She did, this is all in Arabic, she did multiple interviews. One on Anderson Cooper, go online, and Anita Smith, Anderson Cooper, watch that video. You see a snap, of, a shot of, of her. She's with tears, tells how she forgives the men who shot her husband. And Anderson Cooper looked at her and said, how can you do that? And she told him about God forgiving her and the love that he had placed in her heart for the people of Libya. One of the top Arab networks re-ran that interview over and over. Millions of Muslims across the Arabic-speaking world watched that. In Libya, they had watch parties, gatherings to watch that. In a refugee camp in Jordan, refugees watched it because her testimony shocked the world. Joey recruited Ronnie and Anita to Libya. He loved them. And after the incident, he realized the incredible impact that Anita had on Libya. You see, I'm quoting my son now. Libya is, uh, Anita is a homebody. She's shy. She would have told you she was not the strongest on the team. She preferred to stay behind the scenes. Just a normal young mom. And here's what Joey said. I would have said she was the least effective on our team in evangelism and disciple making. But as a result of Ronnie's death and her courage and grace to forgive and write that open letter, she found herself in the middle of God's work, even though suffering, and God used her more than any of us. In fact, in the end, she shared the gospel with more Libyans than anyone I've ever heard of, most likely more than any other person in the history of Arab Libya, the least likely person with the greatest impact through the harshest suffering for the accomplishment of God's redemptive purposes. And in one church alone, 20 young adults moved to the Middle East to take Ronnie's place. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained, and they called out with a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Apparently, God has a certain number of martyrs who must die. And when that number is done, the end comes. And some may be in this room right now. 
You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. You will be some, they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. Friends, we must not water down the call to suffering. And this sounds so foreign to us. This is so strange to us. But Jesus is highly realistic. He's so brutally honest. And I realize that when I preach like this and when I pray like this, this may very well happen. I know that. People are dying all the time for the cause of Christ. The theme of this weekend, if anyone would come after me, must deny himself, take up a cross, and follow me. I think this is a warning for us not to elevate comfort and safety and to assume that if some one of our missionaries is killed, we've made a mistake. No, on the contrary. On the contrary. So, retired people, go for it. Do you know why God in his providence permits discount airline tickets for senior adults? <laughs> to make mission trips. In fact, I've, I've often asked myself, I don't know if this is the case or not, is it a sin not to have an updated passport? Because you might be saying, I'm not available. I'm not available. I don't know if that's a sin or not. Young people, uh, go for it. I challenge you to do what? Ruth and I have done. Lord, whatever your will is for our kids, may they be obedient to you. And as Joey headed to Libya, he sat in the airport in Memphis with both sets of parents, his wife's parents and our parents, and he looked at me and he said, this is your fault, Dad. <laughs> it's the way you raised us. This is where you projected us to. God's great goal and purpose is that people everywhere come to know him and enjoy him and love him and be loved by him. That's good news. It's wonderful news. And it's going to happen based on a promise by Almighty God, and it will not happen. The means the agency that God uses to fulfill his purpose is suffering. John Patton went as a missionary to the South Sea Islands, to the New Hebrides Islands, 100 years ago. It was a real crisis whether he should go or not. He was 17 years old. Earlier, two missionaries had been clubbed to death and eaten by cannibals. So he's really struggling. His parents said this, When you were given to us, we laid you on the altar, our firstborn, to be consecrated, if God saw fit, as a missionary of the cross, and it has been our constant prayer that you might be prepared, qualified, and led to this very decision. We pray with all of our hearts that the Lord may accept your offering, long spare you, and give you many souls from the heathen world. May there be parents like this. Let's pray together. Father, we've heard your word as best I know how to present it. And I pray that you would speak to each one of us. That we might ask the question that those Cubans asked of, Ron, of Joey and me. What's my next step? What is my next step in this? Support, pray, give, encourage, go, send. What's my next step? Lord, none of this makes any sense apart from the resurrection of your son, Jesus. And we thank you that he and that is our final hope. That someday all wrongs will be righted. All things made as you desire. And until that day, whether it's easy or it's not easy at all, Help us to be what you said here, firm to the end, trusting you, serving you. 
I pray, Lord, that at the end around the throne of Jesus, there will be people from different people groups who have come to know you because of the witness and testimony of people in this room. May that happen, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.